Washington Journal continues. Joining us now is Representative Mark Pocan. He's a Democrat from Wisconsin, a member of the Appropriations Committee, also a member of the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus. He serves as a co-chair of that caucus. Representative, thanks, sir, for coming back to the program. Welcome. Thank you, Pedro. Glad to be here. I I've seen these headlines, and I just want to share one from The Hill recently about the current state of negotiations when it comes to going back and forth. This is the headline from The Hill saying, jittery Democrats worried about the president's concessions during this process. Is that something that worries you? Well, I, you know, I think what's happening is you've got two different sets of negotiations happening at once. The Republicans have said they want to cut spending 22 percent. They want to go back to 22 levels of spending and they won't touch, uh, of course, uh, non-discretionary. They won't touch defense. So that means 22 percent uh, cuts to everything else. But it's such a ridiculous idea. They can't even put it on paper and put out a budget like the Democrats have, like the president has. So in the middle of this whole uh, discussion about the, lifting the debt ceiling, which we've done, what, 86 times, uh, because that's the right thing to do is to pay your bills, I think they're having discussions about the budget because, you know, I serve on the Appropriations Committee. They've only put out a couple little bills right now because they don't know how to live up to the very big claims they've made that they're going to cut spending. So I think there's two tracks going going on. Um, there should be no ne negotiations, quite honestly, on paying our bills, on lifting the debt ceiling. And when it comes to the budget, that's exactly what we do on the Appropriations Committee. But I think the challenge is they can't even put the ridiculous level of cuts that they've proposed on paper. And because of that, they have to have this parallel track to negotiate to kind of bluntly save embarrassment. And so, but back to the president, as far as uh, are you concerned about concessions he may make during this process? Well, I think that he's in consultation with Congress. I think if there are concessions, so to speak, it's part of the budget process that they're talking about. But, you know, when it comes to the debt ceiling, uh, playing chicken with it, period, is a dangerous game for the American people. Uh, it means a lot of people will lose their jobs. Interest rates will spike overnight for people who want to buy homes and small businesses who want to buy equipment. Um, it means that stock markets will have a big dip. Uh, there's a lot of negative things that happen. No one should want to uh, put us in that situation. And there's no way the House Republicans, just because of some of their more extreme members, should go there. Uh, one of the things in the last couple of days was Speaker McCarthy saying one of his red lines, so to speak, was these work requirements for some of those people on some federal programs. What do you think about that as being a, a point of discussion? Yeah, see, this is the problem, because his caucus has got so many extreme members now. Th this is not like a problem that constituents call us and say, hey, this is what's going on. we got to do something about this problem. Uh, this is merely a demand because some people think we should should take hostages right now. Uh, you don't take hostages over the nation's full faith and credit, uh, and you got to make sure that we pay our bills. So, you know, uh, this is more of a problem Kevin McCarthy has with his own members. Uh, if he was strong enough, he would stand up to those members and say, no, we're not going to crash uh, the economy because you came to Washington and want a T-shirt that says you did this. Um, but right now, he hasn't done that yet. I think he's hearing from many others, many Senate Republicans. Uh, the only entity that, that seems to want to play a game around the debt ceiling right now is the House Republicans. Even the Senate Republicans realize that this is a very dangerous game. So to, uh, on those uh, work requirements, he talked about that yesterday, but he mentioned your state in the process. So I want to play him a little bit about what he had to say and then get your perspective on sure. it. Remember what we're talking about when we're talking about work requirements. It's only for those people who are able-bodied with no dependents. You could be going to school, no problem. You could be looking for work, no problem. Wisconsin just passed this by 82%. The president, as senator, voted for it. We find every statistical data, it helps Americans get better jobs and work. And then let's just turn it on its head. So if you take a Democrat position, what you're telling to Americans is, I need to go borrow more money from China to give to somebody who's able-bodied, no dependents, and pay them not to work. Well, what you really want to help them is get them into the workforce. Give them a, a sense of pride. Give them more in common. Every statistic tells you it helps the individual. And I want to help more Americans. So that was the speakers. And let's start with the mention of your state. Could you clarify and at least expand on that for us, please? Sure. There was an advisory referendum. We don't have binding referendums in Wisconsin saying that um, uh, something to the effect of people should have to work to get benefits. Uh, so he's somewhat not somewhat, he is twisting what the vote actually was and what actually is happening in Wisconsin um, because of it. But the problem is, uh, and I'm an employer, uh, I actually have had a small business for 30, 
five years, I believe it is. Uh, I got to think how long I've had it. Um, and most of the people here, even though half of the co my colleagues are millionaires, I am not. Uh, they've never run a small business, right? Many people have inherited money and, and a lot of other things. The bottom line is it's not as simple as what they're putting out there. I, I mean, you know, SNAP, for example, to get the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program money, I mean, it's the number one program that keeps kids out of poverty. To mess around with something like that when there's no current problem with it is not a good idea. In fact, if you want to help people get to work, we should help in a lot of other areas around job training. As an employer, I can tell you it's actually hard right now in some sectors uh, to be able to bring people in, but you can't just bring someone in who's got a work requirement with no training. Uh, that's a ridiculous idea. It's not a sustainable job. It doesn't help businesses. So you know, there's a lot of rhetoric that is red meat for the Republican base uh, that Kevin McCarthy is saying, but not practical for someone who's actually ever run a business or, or actually signed a front of a paycheck. Our guests with us until nine o'clock. If you want to ask them questions, you can do on the lines 202-748-8000 for Democrats. 202-748-8001 for Republicans. Independence, 202-748-8002. If you want to text us, you can do that at 202-748-8003. Representative Pocan, some reporting this morning about the possibility of a discharge petition uh, to be put forth in relation to this. Can you explain what that is and what the likelihood of that succeeding would be? Yeah, this is trying to find five adults uh, bluntly uh, in the Republican caucus who will stand up to the stupid rhetoric uh, about the debt ceiling and join every single Democrat to make sure uh, that we're lifting the debt ceiling. It's a it's a p only way the minority can get something on the floor, really, uh, is to have a petition that's signed by 218 people. So 213 Democrats can sign it. Uh, we need five Republicans to join the many Senate Republicans who said uh, we have to do this. Uh, so that's the process. There's a timeline to it but it would take us into early June, which is about the time that the debt ceiling date uh, has been declared. So it's it's kind of a fail safe, right? If, if we can't just get people to do the right thing because it's the right thing, uh, we've got a vehicle that allows some people to be adults. And who do you, uh, do you have a sense of who those five Republicans that are being targeted or, or looked at as far as possibly coming over and doing that? Well, it should be more than five, right? I mean, this should be a no-brainer. Three times under President Trump, we lifted the debt ceiling because it's the right thing to do. We shouldn't have to be extorted or have hostages taken like the Republicans are trying to do. So hopefully there'll be dozens uh, who are willing to break with this kind of crazy wing of the Republican Party that thinks it's a good idea to default on our payments as a country. Um, but I don't know if there's just five. It should be way more. When do you think that might move forward? Um, I, I think uh, today is a day that you're going to see some action. I mean, it's it's by the time on the calendar that we have to get this done, uh, we've got to start it. But there was a certain amount of time that things had to get to in order to start this process. Uh, when it comes then to another like break glass kind of scenario, this idea of using the 14th Amendment uh, to, to bypass this, uh, what do you think about that? I completely support it. I mean, I, when I got to Congress, my very first session, and I've been there 10 and a half years, I was on the Budget Committee. And at that time, I said what a stupid, only in Washington idea it was to have a separate vote on the debt ceiling. You know, Congress votes to uh, pass a budget, expend money, um, it's like if you sign a mortgage, this is the best way to explain it, you don't get to decide whether or not every month you're going to mail the check, right? Because if you don't mail the check, you lose your home and your credit's destroyed. It's no different than for the federal government. So it's stupid that we have this separate vote uh, that does this because it allows literally handfuls of people, like we're seeing right now, uh, hold up the entire federal government. So, you know, the 14th Amendment's very clear, uh, and I think the president should uh, evoke the parts of the 14th Amendment that would just get us past this. Because the bottom line is, I think this is more about the Republicans unable to put a budget together with the rhetoric that matches this 22 percent cut that they've said they're going to do to veterans, to law enforcement, uh, to health care and education, go down the list. Um, it's just impossible to put on paper. So what they're doing is they're looking for something to distract people from the fact they can't actually do their job, which is what we're doing right now, the appropriation bills. Uh, you know, let's find every way possible to make sure we pay our bills, but then let's also uh, get to the product we have to do, which is our annual budgets. Again, Representative Mark Pocan joining us for this discussion. Our first call is Jay. He's in Florida, Republican line for you. Uh, Jay, you're on with our guests. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, Ms. Poco, I think that you are either misinformed about quite a few things or you just don't care. But I, I, I have been listening to you now. I, I called in because I wanted to talk about Fetterman's comment, which ties into kind of what you're saying. 
you've used a, at least a dozen derogatory words towards the Republican Party. This kind of rhetoric is what's going on. It's driving this country insane. And you continue to push this, and you're also going to try to push something that violates the Constitution. That 14th Amendment doesn't have the right to do it. It would be challenged in the Supreme Court, and it would go beyond the deadline. So for you to say, oh, I wholeheartedly support it, you obviously haven't read the Constitution. And as Mr. Fetterman, when he makes a comment saying, should Congress have to have a work requirement? We've had a work requirement. When I went on welfare back in 1982 after coming out of a coma, they had work requirements. They had retraining programs. All those programs are still there. They just don't use them anymore because they can sit at home. Nobody enforces it. Okay. Thanks, caller. Sure. So <clears throat> let me explain it this way. Um, there are, and I think many people would agree with me who aren't Democrats, uh, a, a number of members of the Republican caucus uh, that are just here to, quite honestly, uh, the term we use around here, to be exotics, uh, right? They're just extreme. They want to get on TV. Uh, they want to be able to raise money. And they're not here to actually govern. The problem is the Republicans have a five-seat majority, and there's more than five of those people. I'm not saying it's the vast majority of Republicans who are holding things up. But it is that small number that, quite honestly, appealed to big chunks of the base, especially the Trump supporters, um, that uh, make it impossible for the rest to be able to govern. So, yes, there are some people that we should just not listen to within that caucus and do the responsible thing, which is paying the nation's bills. And if people won't do that, we do have to be a little more aggressive with them. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that you're going to do 22 percent cuts across the board uh, for all discretionary spending that's not defense. Uh, but that's the numbers that they put out there which is why they can't put a budget to paper because it's so ridiculous. Well, we have to call that out because that's why we're having this problem. If they can't put their rhetoric to paper, they have to find a way to try to change the conversation. And, you know, it's a risky game to put uh, everyone in the country's uh, economic well-being at risk, which is what it is. Ra rising interest rates, uh, having the stock market uh, crash, having a lot of people lose their jobs. Uh, that is not worth the political games that they're playing. Uh, from Josie in Pennsylvania, Democrats line. Hi, good morning. Um, hi, Mr. Representative. I have a couple questions for you. First of all, why are there so many staff members for the members of Congress and the Senate? I mean, I think that could be scaled way back. That would save us a lot of money. I definitely think that all the tax breaks that were given out during the two Republicans, uh, Bush and Trump, should, should be scaled back, if not completely taken away. Increase the, the type of Social Security where, where you can pay on higher, the higher scale so that they pay more money. People that are rich really don't need a break on Social Security. And the last thing is, will you guys freeze your pay raises every year? For cost of living, if you're talking, if they're talking, the Republicans are talking about taking away veterans' money and freezing Social Security. Um, they should come out here and try to live on what what we get on Social Security. That's it. Great. There's a lot there. I'm going to see how much I can remember. Uh, first of all, um, Congress hasn't had a pay increase for I believe 14 years, so we kind of have frozen our, our pay. But again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, half my colleagues are millionaires. Uh, you know, it may not be as significant for many, but uh, nonetheless, that, that's the facts. On Social Security, I completely agree with you. Uh, we should lift the cap that says people who make about 160 plus thousand no longer pay into that. Uh, so really, it's a regressive tax. If we lifted that cap, uh, you'd extend the life of Social Security and you could change some of the benefit structures. And I think, you know, things like uh, dental and vision hearing should certainly be covered. We'd like to do that. Um, to the number of staff, uh, I'll tell you, don't forget, a lot of the staff are doing constituent caseworks. We represent over 700,000 people uh, in our districts, and um, they're doing everything from helping people with tax problems, getting their veterans benefits. Their passports right now is a big thing. A lot of people are finally traveling. Um, I'm not sure if that's one of the problems that's out there. And I'm going to miss the fourth category. I knew I was going to do this. Uh, that's three of the four, um, but hopefully that helps. Uh, let me ask you this, though. When it comes to the president's budget that he introduced, if I read it correctly and if the reporting is correct, it would extend some of those tax cuts put forth in the Trump administration, but use new, ta new income or at least new revenue to pay for those. Yeah, well, I mean, that's part of the, the whole debate period is Republicans are only saying we've got to not do this, not do that, not do this. 
but they don't want to raise any revenue. And don't forget, when we passed those uh, tax cuts uh, under Donald Trump, that added one quarter of our nation's debt as a nation, 240 year history, uh, was one quarter of that debt was formed by those tax cuts during the Trump administration. Um, you know, a lot of us would like to roll those back, but you have to talk about revenue as well uh, if you wanna try to get us out of uh, some of the deficit and debt situations we have. The Republicans are completely unwilling to talk about revenue. And when it comes to rolling back, when you take a look at the COVID spending that was done, one of the provisions where at least one of the things they'd be like to see is the so-called clawing back of some of these funds. What do you think about that as a prospect or at least getting back some of that money? You know, I think it's a fair thing to say if we have not used some COVID funds by now, um, three years into this, uh, we should at least see if they still need the funds for COVID purposes or not. I think that's a fair question. Um, but, you know, we had the same question a year ago, and I'm not sure how that exactly got resolved. Uh, from Missouri, this is Jamie, Republican line. Hi, Pedro. Uh, first of all, sir, why are you referring to MAGA people in such a negative way? Because I like to make America great again. And that's really personally, that's very uh, hurtful. Secondly, why do you even address the veterans being cut in this bill? The bill is H.R. 2811. It does not cut. It, actually, the debt ceiling was extended. Biden will not even look at it. And there's nothing, nothing in this bill about hurting our vets. Why are you being so dishonest? Please work with us. God bless you. And Pedro, I love you. Have an amazing day. Great. Well, thank you. I'll tell you, the reason I use mega, honestly, is because hundreds of thousands of people wear red hats that say make America great again, mega. So um, if you don't like the term, um, you're going to have to talk to the people who make all the, the caps. Uh, so that uh, answers that. Uh, on veterans, here's the bottom line, and I serve on the Appropriations Committee. Your budget is like this. There's non-discretionary funds, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, that we can't cut by law, and we shouldn't because it's your money that you've paid into a fund, so when you retire, it's available for you. Then there's discretionary funds. About over half of that is defense, and the Republicans have said they are not going to cut defense spending. So all the cuts that they want to do are going to have to happen in one little portion uh, of the, everything that's discretionary and non-defense. And that includes veterans benefits. That includes uh, housing and education and health care, law enforcement, border protection. So when they have a budget that wants to cut overall 22 percent and they won't put it on paper details because they can't, the only thing we can assume is that's a 22% cut across the board, which would cut all sorts of things. And don't forget, uh, even outside of the veterans department funding, there are all kinds of programs that are in other departments uh, that give food assistance and housing assistance to veterans and job training that also would be eligible for cuts. So I say it because it's true, um, and that is a problem. I don't think you know we should be balancing any kind of uh, budget on the backs of veterans. Uh, this is from Ronald. Ronald is on our independent line in South Carolina. Ronald, good morning. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm one of the people that you don't never hear from, but I just had enough. Uh, stupidity is what's the matter with the USA. You first started off Republicans, Democrats, they fed each other. Now you got this red state and blue state. And they do nothing except fighting each other. Uh, the Republicans always go to California and Chicago, a red, blue state, blue state. They don't never mention Florida and Texas. Right now, Texas is the worst state they are as far as crime, but you don't never hear about that. Uh, we're fighting each other. Democrats, Republicans, we fight each other. We don't need this red, blue, red, blue, uh, red state. That only proves that whoever won the last president election, I mean, that can change from day to day. But we're, we're stupidity, and I think we need to uh, stop that and go back to grade school. Got your point, caller. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think Ronald brings up a really good point that's really evident right now as we're talking about the debt ceiling. I mean, it should be a no-brainer. Um, 86 times in this country we have lifted the debt ceiling to match uh, the, the expenditures already approved by Congress just to pay our bills so that we don't jeopardize the nation's economy. It should be a no-brainer. And yet right now there's a partisan fight over this. And, you know, honestly, we need to do what we've done those previous 86 times is lift it, 
then let's get together and talk about a budget. There may be different values, and that's where you hash that out in that process. But just having a high-stakes fight like we are right now, I think, goes to Ronald's point. It's a lot of um, you know, fighting that's not necessary, that's more based on uh, people's political ideology. And I, I would hope that people would just join hands and do the right thing on this. Representative, you can clear something for it. The Republicans do want to see that rollback to FY22. Does the defense budget then become part of that? No, they said, um, uh, Kay Granger, who's the chair of the Appropriations Committee, has said they will not cut defense. So that's why we look at the numbers, and it's about 22 percent of everything else that's discretionary spending, non-defense, that would have to be cut to match those numbers. But that's, Pedro, exactly the reason why you haven't seen a budget put out like the president and the Democrats have. Because how do you determine that? Like people say, well, but I don't want to cut this part of veterans benefits and I don't want to cut uh, this part of Homeland Security and I don't want to cut this and that. Well, then suddenly the other cuts become 30, 40 percent. Well, 40 percent, you're going to cut what, education or health care? It's just impossible to put a budget like that on paper because it's more like fantasy Congress than real Congress. So I, I think that's the issue um, is they've, they've put out some rhetoric they probably can't live up to. It's fine just to walk it back. But we do need to pay our bills, and then we do need to get a budget done going into the next session. Let me ask you about the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus, which you're a co-chair. What's the purpose? Um, so the purpose is I mean, we spend a lot of money on defense with almost no checks and balances. So uh, they have, the Defense Department has never been able to pass an audit like almost every other department in federal government. They should have to. I think that's a, a minimum, right? Just make sure that we've got responsible budgeting going on. I think the last audit, uh, they couldn't find something like 40 percent of their equipment uh, under the audit. Uh, that's a problem. Um, secondly, we know there's a lot of programs that, that fail at, at providing the services promised to taxpayers when we're spending their money. Um, we had put, I think, something like $8 billion into amphibious vehicles that only sank. Um, the most recent class of uh, aircraft carrier, the Ford class, uh, has a problem that when the toilets clog, you have to flush $400,000 worth of chemicals, of acids, down the drain, literally flushing money down the drain. Um, no other department can get away with spending like that. We should at least have uh, proper things in place to make sure that we're having some accountability for our tax dollars and we even know where our equipment is. So that's why um, uh, a number of us, Barbara Lee and myself, formed it, but a number of us are very concerned uh, about that spending. A few more minutes with our guests. Let's hear from Dennis in Ohio, Democrats line. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to expound on something that you kind of brought up earlier. Is the Demo or, excuse me, the Republicans keep saying they want compromise, they want cuts, they want compromise, they want cuts. Well, why aren't the Democrats demanding the same thing? Why aren't they saying, hey, if you want cuts, here's what we want you to do. We want you to take back all the tax cuts that you gave the wealthy and the and the big business, and we will use that money to bring down the deficit. I mean, why are the Demo uh, Democrats not saying compromise? You watch how fast if they said that. Watch how fast Republicans would stop wanting compromise. Yeah, well, two things. One, uh, as I said, this shouldn't be a negotiation on the debt ceiling. Uh, we need to pay our bills that we've already allocated. It's the responsible thing to do. And for many of us, we're saying the proper place to have the debate that they want to have about spending is in the appropriations process right now that we're in the middle of that they can't put a budget to paper on because of some of the ideas that they've said they want to do that aren't doable. Um, and secondly, the president has said, you know, you guys are unwilling to talk about revenue. What about revenue? It's not just cuts. The balance would be uh, to have some revenues in place. And they've said that's a non-starter. So, yes, uh, it has been brought uh, to them. But I think the bottom line, again, is this shouldn't be a negotiation on whether or not we pay our bills. You can't negotiate uh, whether or not you're going to mail your mortgage check. Uh, you'll lose your home and you'll destroy your credit. The same is true for the federal government, and we need to be responsible like individual families are. A couple other things, if I may, before we let you go. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on the recent uh, attack in the home offices of Jerry Conley, a Democrat from Virginia. What that says about security it, it, that you and others may be concerned about as far as your, where your security is, not only in here in D.C., but back home. Yeah, so it's interesting. We were just told yesterday that in the last six years, I think the threats to members have gone up 400 um, percent. And what's interesting is if you go back six years, that uh, coincides with when Donald Trump became president. Clearly, some of the rhetoric that's out there is what's you know driving people. And I think we do have to just tone all of that rhetoric down. Uh, you know, 
you can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. You can uh, not have to get people to the point of, you know, wanting to carry a bat into an office and start, you know, hurting people. That rhetoric, especially from people like Donald Trump, a former president, has to get toned way down because uh, the rise in, in attacks and threats is way up. And just, uh, I don't know if rhetoric was a part of the attacks from the, uh, Representative Connolly's uh, situation as well, so. Well, no, but if you have someone, we've tracked it, 400% increase in threats to members in the last six years. So um, that's the numbers they just gave us, and that should be troubling. Uh, do you think that uh, as a result of that, more money for security for these offices could come about, or is there discussion on that? Um, you know, they did give all members, uh, I think, $10,000 out of their office accounts for uh, home security, and not all members have taken advantage of that yet. So I think that is one option that is available. Democrats and Republicans uh, should be able to, to be able to do that. Um, but our office is already, I know my office in Madison, you know, has a secure lock system and um, special glass and everything, and that's been in place since since before I got there uh, 10 and a half years ago. So I think our offices have some of that in place. Again, just toning down any kind of uh, violent rhetoric has to happen. Um, and we need everyone from the very top, um, presidents and former presidents, to also do that. Let's hear from Minnesota Republican line. This is Ray. Hello. Hello. See, my question is to the representative. We're $31 trillion in debt. The service that debt is five billion a year, and every year, if not more, the Democrats want to spend one point two or three trillion over what we take in in taxes. How long will this go on for the foreseeable future if you are left in charge? I mean, yeah. do you see a problem with that? Do you? No, absolutely. That's why we have to raise revenues to match uh, expenditures, ideally. And unfortunately, um, we're being told you can't talk about revenue by the Republicans. But I really want to reemphasize a point I made earlier, um, that in our 240 years uh, history as a nation, a quarter of our debt, 25 percent of our debt occurred just during the Trump presidency when he did the tax breaks for the wealthiest, where 83 percent of the money went to the top one percent. So if you are concerned about debts, uh, there's some other people you might want to talk to about that because the reality is a quarter of our nation's history of debt occurred in the last administration. Uh, let's go to Charles, last call. Uh, independent line from Pennsylvania. Charles, go ahead. Yes, my, my, my thought here is why are we waiting this long to the 11th hour to be now working on this debt raise, okay? raising the debt ceiling. Why wasn't this negotiated back in February? You had several months to do this and nobody was talking. Okay, the president dropped the ball, doesn't want to talk to anybody. I, I'm a former Republican, went independent because both parties can kiss my perverse. <laughs> I hear you, Charles. Um, hey, so, so I think here's the bottom line. Um, as I said, we've done this 86 times, three times during the Trump administration. This is a provision that shouldn't even exist, a separate vote to decide whether you're mailing the check for money that we've already approved as Congress. This doesn't stop any spending whatsoever. It merely is, is kind of accounting in nature, uh, lifting that uh, debt ceiling. So um, it, it's something that we should be doing, period. The fight, if, if you really want to reduce spending, you have it during the appropriations process. And that's the process that we have started literally this week um, in Congress. But we have yet to see a budget from the Republicans like the president and Democrats have put forward because, again, they can't put something to paper that matches the rhetoric they said they want to do, which is 22 percent cuts to all things discretionary spending that isn't defense. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I think you got to call some of your uh, Republican elected officials and ask them why they haven't put that budget together. But that's the time to do it uh, right now. Our fiscal year ends September 30th. We're marking it up in appropriations. But that's where the responsibility has to happen for spending less if you want to spend less. Our guest is a member of, a member of the Appropriations Committee, Mark Pocan, representative, Democratic representative from Wisconsin. As always, sir, thank you for coming back to the program. Thank you, Pedro. I appreciate it.